The long search is open to anybody. You don't have to go to Benares, India to start it, though we did. It doesn't have a tidy beginning, middle and end. You're on it the moment you start wondering where you were before you were born, where you'll go when you die, and what you're on earth for in the meantime. If you knew the answers, you wouldn't ask the questions. But other people's answers should be worth collecting, and so should other people's questions. That's what we're going to try to do. You're probably wondering who I am and what gives me the right to launch one of these big film series. After all, when they've happened before, there's been a known authority doing what I'm doing. And I agree with you that you don't immediately look to a London-based, Yorkshire-born, displaced theatre director to guide you through other people's religious beliefs. But that's to expect the wrong thing. I'm not here as any sort of authority. I'm more of a bridge. Authority, this time, has to rest in the people we come across and talk to and visit because it's their way of life we're looking at. It's one thing to sit at home and discuss Hinduism, but quite another to go out to India and try and find it. For a start, who do you trust? Scholarly people talk history. Devout people push their own brand of devotion. Busy people haven't time to talk to you. Simple people don't have the words for it and the holiest people keep their mouths shut. In Benares, I came across Mr. N.K. Sharma, a tourist guide who turned out to be a pundit. He was my first guru. It couldn't possibly be more confused, so we're starting with many already, right? The next move for us is really to try and concentrate and make that concentrate on one thing. That's correct. That's right. That's correct. That's correct. Because otherwise we yeah. go mad. I mean, noise and the... But you find it... smoke in your throat. My first brush with a Hindu god was in this street on his feast day. He had the head of an elephant, sat cross-legged, was made of painted clay and came in different sizes. This was Ganesha, the remover of obstacles. We were going to need Ganesha. Are you a devotee of Ganesha yourself, Mr. Sharma? No, particularly not. I am a devotee of Kali. Of Kali? Kali. Well, what does that mean? Kali is a wife of Shiva in her uh, terrific aspect, not tolerating any wrong. Mm -hmm. she's, yeah, she, when you see pictures of Kali, she looks, she's got a, a bloody tongue right, and is carrying right, heads. Yes. But she appears very terrific. Yep. And many people tell that she is uh, not a, a good goddess, mm. but actually she is terrific to finish bad. Yep. She's a violent goddess. Uh, yes, violent goddess. Yes. But she is violent to finish uh, the, what is bad, what is yes. wrong, what is worse. But if I said to you, what is God, you're not going to tell me that it is any one of these people, are you? Yeah, or yeah. these, these uh, um, sub-gods. You're not going to say it is Ganesha or it is Kali. If I said to you, what is God, how would you put it? Uh, uh, then there are different uh, stages of belief. And the highest st stage we call Brahma. And that in English you can call it supreme. Mm. supreme. One supreme, supreme. god. Yeah. Now this is a potter's yard and you can find little shattered images of clay gods all over. This is not a put-up job, but at our feet, as we sat down, was a part of a, a head of Lakshmi, wife of Vishnu. Are you telling me that an image, a clay image, really contains god? No, the, uh, there is not a god actually in it. Mm. But it is a symbol of God. Mm. These statues are just like a pointer. Suppose I want to point you something like this. How long I should keep my finger like this? As long you have not seen the object. Mm. But as soon you have seen the object, I remove my finger. But aren't there some people who you point, mm -hmm. you point because you want them to see something, yeah. and they never... They never understand what you're pointing at, so the whole of their lives, they're yeah, actually th looking at your finger. That's correct. And for there, God is not in a hurry. 
<laughs> God is not in a hurry. The images are just a, a, like kindergarten boxes. They give you a star and not required in advanced education. Educational toys. Uh, educational toys, yes. Are there rules of conduct in Hindu scriptures? The first thing I should tell that Hinduism is not a strict, rigid religion. It is a philosophy of life. It is a way of life. Everybody is free to behave as his mind, his conscience deems fit. And it is good as long as it is not harming anybody. It is always good and nobody has to say anything. Do you mean that we're all Hindus, really, going various ways? I think uh, at the highest stage, there is nobody beyond Hinduism. Everybody is a Hindu. It was odd to hear Mr. Sharma use the word Hinduism and insist at the same time that Indian religion is no one thing with one founder, one Bible and one organization. Perhaps he was trying to be kind to a Westerner, so he used a tidy, all-embracing Western label. Millions of people, one sacred Ganges. Millions of gods, one god. I was starting to pick up clues. This is how it looked in the middle of the day. At dawn, there'd been less soap and more praying. But the early morning worshippers also did their laundry. And in among the midday laundry, there was no end to the prayer. Where do you draw the line? Is there even a line to draw? If this religion is a way of life, there isn't. I gazed into that river and remembered the irreverent explorer who said that the Ganges is considered pure because no microbe can stay alive in it. Yet, just to report, devout Hindus told me that Ganges water kept in a bottle never goes bad. Pious locals cook and wash in nothing else. It's a great healer. The Ganges, in other words, is a goddess. She purifies everything and everyone she touches, instantly and utterly. Poor people save all their lives for just one chance to immerse themselves in her. With your own eyes, you can see the garbage and you can see the faith. Both are real. That's the dilemma. The steady coming and going of pilgrims in Benares never stops, nor does the chanting that's amplified day and night up and down the river. But every few years, there's a planned concentration of bathers at one time and in one or other of the holy places along the river. This is in Allahabad, where the Ganges joins the Yamuna. This meeting lasted about a month in all, and tents sprang up on the mudflats to house the rallies and the prayer meetings and the mobile sick bays and the offices for lost property and lost people. On an ordinary day here in Haridwar, there's a 10-minute walk from the town centre to the river. When these pictures were taken, there were seven million bathers and it took five hours. All right. How do you put, in a nutshell, what's going through the minds of a million assorted bathers? Or the mind of even one? You suddenly get an aerial picture of the whole of India crisscrossed by streams of people making for holy rivers and holy rivers making for the sea. We made a plan. Three quarters of the population of India live in villages. So three quarters of the trudging pilgrims who go in search of the great river set out from, return to, and live most of their lives in somewhere like this, Bith Bhagwampur in North Bihar. 
It's a remote village, 30 miles from the border of Nepal, and a five-hour jeep ride from the nearest small town. No electricity, no telephone, and a way of life that's been going on pretty much the same for hundreds of years. Shivesh Thakur was born here. It was through him that the village opened itself up to us. Oh, this is the well, get married. Yes, this is the old well. Yes. That used to be the one in the That's been superseded now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And now you use something else. The Takua household is a series of rooms round an enclosed courtyard. His mother, brother, sister in law, two nephews, and three nieces live in one family house. Shivesh himself is a younger son. When he was seven, his father died of snake bite. His elder brother sent him to university. Now, Shivesh is professor and head of the Department of Philosophy in the University of Surrey, England. Across the road lives his aunt. Nearby live four uncles. Well, I've got as many uncles as you like. The whole village is a series of uncles in a certain way because, you know, they all mean things to me and I mean things to them. Uh, most of them literally aren't your uncles, but that's the sort of relationship, and this means simply another way of saying it's the whole village is one community. What's the population of Bitsbagwampur? I would think around five and six thousand. What do most of the villagers do for a living? It's a farming community, um, almost entirely. Do you think they have a hard life? Um, if you... By hard times, you mean, are people able to spend as much on food and luxury items that they do out here in the West? Then, of course, they have a very hard time. They don't have anything like that. But if you live in a village, it's a self-sufficient community. It grows everything that it needs, or virtually everything. I mean, it can't, can't grow kerosene, and it needs a little bit of kerosene to, to light a lamp, for instance, a lantern or a hurricane. But otherwise, uh, the village can carry on living at its present standard of living. Uh, it doesn't matter what happens to the rest of the world. During parts of the year, of course, there is no question of getting about. Not many people do or would want to. The rest of the time, it's people either walk from one place to another or take a bullock cart or a horse cart. And uh, now, of course, uh, this is the technological breakthrough. There are lots of bicycles here. There's a tea shop also, which we passed. When I was growing up in this village, there was no tea shop. In fact, there weren't many people who drank tea. What did uh, they drink? Pardon? What did they drink? Um, they drank water. That's the thing to drink, isn't it? There are four schools in Bhispagwampur, and once a year, like most schools and colleges in India, they celebrate the festival of Saraswati, goddess of art and learning. At the boys' school, the image of the goddess sat on top of a grassy bank that represented the Himalayas with cotton wool for mountain snow. By tradition, Saraswati rides on a white swan, and in her four arms she carries a musical instrument, a pen, a book, and a crystal. Shortly after eight in the morning on the first day, the Sanskrit master, the equivalent in the West might be the Latin master, and one of his pupils came to make the first offerings. Sweets, fruit, flowers, water to wash in, a change of clothes, colored cosmetic paste to mark the face, as if the goddess were a real woman and a real guest. <laughs> Buddhi 
By the way, the food wasn't thrown away. After the goddess, it was offered to the second best guests. That's us. And then to the boys. Pull, pull, pull. The centre of this ritual, I was surprised to find out, isn't the master, it's the boy. He's the one who addresses the goddess in Sanskrit, and the master is there just to prompt him. Now this process is literally um, trying to breathe life into the goddess by certain ritual observation, so by reciting certain sorts of verses and doing correct things as prescribed in the tradition, uh, the boy, on behalf of the school, is inviting the goddess to come and take her seat into this image. And from that point on, uh, for this prescribed time, she actually becomes the seat of that goddess. What did the Saraswati festival mean to you as a boy? It meant a great deal of fun, quite a lot of excitement, and of course, also, I think, um, expectation of great things happening by way of reward. Because, as you know, Saraswati is the goddess of learning, and, and like the child I was, I believe that if I took a couple of my books and put it in front of the image, then somehow after the festival, after the puja, once I brought those backs, books back home, how does it I just have to leaf through the books and I'll get the contents of the whole thing in my mind straight away? It works too, isn't it? I, sp <laughs> I don't know whether, whether, you know, that is what works, but, well, something seems to have worked. We're not now talking about idolatry, are we? We're talking about looking through the piece of simple mm. play to yes. a more abstract, ungraspable thing. Yes. You are, you are look, looking considerably beyond the, the, the piece of clay. The piece of clay is a symbol. And you invoke the symbol uh, in order to address and communicate with something that that symbol represents, which is divinity. I can understand that you, with your mind and training, could have that thought. I wonder how generally it's shared by very simple, devout people, or do they really superstitiously think that that goddess, um, that piece of clay, is something more than clay? Yes. Um, yes, I can see why you asked this question, because it, it sounds like a very sophisticated point to grasp. I think I would be very surprised if you ran into many people who believed that literally that clay was the goddess. Uh, because they're perfectly aware, for instance, that a new clay image is bought every year and installed in this place, and then it's thrown away. So it's not clay you're worshipping, it's what the clay represents. So you're brought up to be used to disposable gods? Disposable clay, disposable stone, disposable iron, whatever material you use. But what these bits of material represent, that's not disposable, and that's not something you can grasp or see or feel or touch. No! How many gods do the Hindus have? <laughs> that's a very tricky one. Sometimes you get mentioned. 330 million gods. So if you like, that's the answer. 330 million? I've been thinking about the 330 million gods of India. Who counted them? What are their names? Does it mean that with 365 days in the year, the gods have their festivals at a rate of about a million a day? Or are the 330 million gods just 330 million different expressions, different facets of one universal god, with the number 330 million thought up to astound the mind? Or would we be right to include among the gods all living things, all plants, all animals, all parents, all teachers, all guests, everything that lives? Because 
A lot of the people we've talked to during this search do claim to see the universal God reflected in all living creatures. Now, if you start thinking about the gods in that way, as including all living things, the number, 330 million, is a wild underestimate of the number there must be. What are the best known of the traditional gods? I suppose the most famous, of course, is the trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Uh, Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is the preserver, or one who maintains the universe in its equilibrium, and Shiva, whose job it is to destroy the world when the world begins to be thoroughly beyond repair. The Hindu idea of creation is not of one final creation. It's a cycle. It's something that goes on all the time. Something in the world that we know is being destroyed now, and something in the world is being recreated now. So normally this works for long periods of time. And when I say long, I didn't mean a few years. I mean a few million, million years, if you like. Uh, but there comes a stage when, so the story goes, uh, the world just can't be maintained. It's completely beyond repair, so it's got to be destroyed, and another one created in its place. So Shiva does the destroying, if you like, and Brahma recreates another world out of that same material. The traditional way of representing the power of a god is to give him a goddess. She's called his Shakti, his consort, his powerhouse. She can be playful, she can be tremendous, she can be terrifying, like the great goddess Kali. Of all the people in Bith Bhagwampur, the one who impressed me most was the one who had given up most. He is a sannyasi, which literally means one who renounces. And this man has renounced everything, his name, his past, his possessions. The villagers call him Mahatma, great soul. He's borrowed his hut, his bed, his lamp. He owns a change of clothes, a water pot, and a few books, though he says they aren't his either. Mahatmaji, what did you do for a living before you withdrew from the world and became a sannyas? I was living to my guru in the ashram. Ah, I and was thinking about life before that. Or before is... that. <laughs> before leaving this, I was a law practitioner in the court. Mm -hmm. yes. Is it something that embarrasses you to talk about your past? It is better if, if we don't want to know my past. You would prefer me not to ask? Not, not to ask, yes. Why should a man leave society, leave his home? To be nearer to God with the object to have peace of mind. And the idea is that this peace and this nearness to God cannot be achieved while a man is in society. Yes, that is our experience. Ex-lawyer, ex-socialist politician, ex-freedom fighter, ex-man on the run from the British police, and not writing his memoirs. <laughs> celebrating the goddess Saraswati, but this time at the girls' school. It seemed to strike nobody but me as odd that performers at a girls' school concert should all be men.
What does the mark on that man's forehead mean? He's uh, a devotee of Vishnu. song I discovered is in honor of the god Shiva. So what you've got here is a devotee of one god singing a song about another god at a festival in honor of a school goddess. These can't be jealous gods. If, by the way, you're getting the impression of a whole community moving amiably from one pious celebration to another, that's how, in some ways, it was for those few weeks. The bad times would come later. Black days in the calendar, the astrologer's warning, drought, the monsoon, floods, weeks of anxiety. Soon, this landscape will be scorched by the sun. Then it will lie under perhaps 10 feet of flood water, marooning the temple and most of the houses and destroying the roads. At the moment, everybody here has something to eat, but the next village is rationed to eating three days a week. I asked the headmaster of the girls' school how he managed to be so cheerful. He answered, we are disaster-proof men. All the same, any action they can think of to avert, control and defuse disaster, they take, even the most ancient. While we were there, four Brahmin priests spent a day from eight in the morning till four in the afternoon chanting Sanskrit hymns and performing a fire ritual to ensure a good harvest. A local Sanskrit scholar told me that this unbroken chant had been going on somewhere in India for at least 3,000 years, and all we were doing was plugging into an endless sound and releasing it over the land. I was told I should think of the fire as the mouth of God. It devours the offerings and turns them into smoke. In the same way, our prayers are devoured and turned into power. Shinesh, are you sure it doesn't make any difference that very few people can understand a word of what's going on? It's the same as in the West, when you need an electrical engineer, sophisticated equipment, where you get an electrical engineer from wherever he's available. He comes and does the job, we don't fiddle with it. And so the Pandit Siddhar scholars, they knew what was happening, and the village came and listened reverently and respectfully, waiting for the results, which they know will come. They may not, but as far as they are concerned, they believe it will. Are there people in the village who think the whole day's business is a waste of time? Oh, I'm certain there are a few people, um, quite a few there maybe, you know, because um, there, are, there are all sorts of skeptics in the village, and skepticism is as long established a tradition in India as anything else. So there are skeptics who believe this is just a waste of time, you know, we should go and do something about it rather than have these uh, priests chanting scripture. Uh, but I would think the majority of the village do believe that this is something important and efficacious. Jo ni rendra 
These men are what's usually called in the West high caste Hindus, Brahmins. By that I don't mean rich or powerful, I mean high caste. If you think of a man born again and born again, working his way up a spiral, good deed by good deed, good life by good life, and going up through one caste after another, you could say that these men are supposed to be near the top. And the prayer they repeat every morning is special to them. Somewhere a morning hymn started. We couldn't locate it till we looked up. The blossoms that he's picking are for the village temple, which is dedicated to the god Shiva. It's rather difficult to recall how I used to feed as a boy. But, but I think it was, it was one of getting carried away on huge big waves of something or the other. You got there and here were crowds of priests and other people. And suddenly at some precise second or minute I couldn't understand, things went bang. And then once the bang started, it was such a huge big bang that you got carried away with it. And things started happening all over you in your, in your bones, in your marrow, in everything. What is down in that darkness? Um, it's the stone symbol of um, Shiva and Shakti. That, uh, you, you, yes, wouldn't, the... you wouldn't be wrong to see something remotely sexual in this image. No, you won't be. Um, um, we have seen that Shiva is supposed to be the destroyer god in, in some ways. And yet, you see, his representation happens to be in terms of the male and female sex organs. That's what it vaguely looks like, and that's, of course, the sign of fertility. So clearly, the idea being suggested to you is, and I hope you grasp it, everyone does, uh, that destruction and creation aren't seen as utterly distinct things. One leads into the other, so the very Shiva that destroys is also represented as this sign of procreation. It's odd to think that these pieces of masonry, cold and meaningless in a Western museum, were once surrounded by noise and flowers and prayers and drumming. There's nothing in these faces to suggest here are men who know they are worshipping one of 330 million gods. As far as you can see, they're worshipping just one god. But I'd started with the idea of a vast number and it stuck. I'm still troubled about the 330 million gods of India. And the trouble isn't the number, 330 million, but the word gods. If we could call them Hindu saints, the numbers would be less of a problem. 
and it wouldn't seem to be too bad a label. After all, Hindu gods, like Catholic saints, have their festivals and feast days. They are the objects and means of devotion. They are regarded as a pathway through to God and seen as reflecting God back onto the earth like a mirror. When I asked the Mahatma, who lives on the outskirts of this Bhagwanpur, to try and help me to grasp what the gods were, the words he used could easily have come from a devout Catholic talking about a Christian saint. He described the real god, Brahman, as the powerhouse, and the 330 million visible gods as light bulbs, which were working off divine electricity. Of course, the comparisons between the gods and the saints do collapse very soon. For a start, you can't place many of the Hindu gods in recorded history. Most of them were born before it. And there's no Hindu equivalent of the papal office that uh, examines the claims of new saints and decides which ones shall be admitted and which shan't. But just to dislodge the word gods for a bit does lessen the feeling of being overwhelmed by a multitude especially when you were brought up not to believe that there's more gods than one. Tell me if I'm wrong, but I gather that traditionally Hindu society splits into four main castes. There are the religious leaders, that's the Brahmins, the military leaders, the businessmen, and the caste that serves the other three, the Shudras. Can you say what caste these boys are? No, I'm afraid I can't. I, I just know that these are boys. So boys, any... young, young boys are on yeah. a heap, and yes. they're just yes. boys. Indeed. Fine. What about the untouchables? The untouchables happen to be a subclass of the last of these shudras. Since they were eventually seen as doing dirty jobs, it tended to sort of, you know, keep them away from the others, and th thereby, I suppose, there was untouchability in these untouchables whom Gandhi later called Harijans, who are men of God. But what about caste as it is today? Caste, in a straightforward sense of the term, represents simply an institutionalization of the division of labor. Different people do different things. So calling them by different caste names is one way of identifying who does what. Um, What's gone wrong, or what seems to be wrong today, is that these caste functions have become hereditary. The Brahmin tradition, and it's a religious tradition, sees a man's life pegged out in four distinct stages. Somewhere between the ages of seven and thirteen, a boy from a high caste family is prepared for his initiation, his ritual birth, and he makes his entry into the first of the four stages of his life. To mark this second birth, a sacred thread is slipped over his left shoulder and he's taught the prayer of the twice born. When you went through your initiation, Shivesh, were you more impressed by the fun of it than by any religious significance? In most ways, but, but I was quite aware that it was something very, very important which I mustn't take lightly. Isn't a boy in those circumstances also aware that everybody of all ages has seemed to be gathering to do something for him? For him, yes. And that must this be very weighty. Already, yes. This is, the, this is part of the idea that the boy is gradually ceasing to be a boy and, and becoming a responsible agent. And the fact that all these people and all these things have been gathered just especially for this occasion, marking something about him, means that he's beginning to see that he's something important from now on and he must do certain things, behave in certain ways and not others. The thread ceremony itself is just the climax of sometimes months of preparation. 
When it's all over, the twice-born are cleaned up as if they were starting their lives all over again. If he's a Brahmin, the next step, as it was a few hundred years ago, would be for the boy to leave home, join his guru, his teacher, in a forest retreat, and learn the scriptures. It's different these days. Only the symbols are left. Wooden wheels for a chariot, and umbrella and finery to mark his new status in society. Stage two starts with marriage, probably an arranged marriage, and setting up a house with a wife you may scarcely know. I remember riding round Benares with my guide, Mr. Sharma, and hearing him say, in India, we don't marry the girl we love, we love the girl we marry. <laughs> This is your brother, uh, Umesh, right? Mm -hmm. And he's the head of your household. Yes. Uh, what does that mean in practice? Does that give him great authority? Um, well, it means that, um, you know, he's the man who has overall responsibility for the running of the family together and all the things that it's supposed to do. Um, all the matters referring to the family would be referred to him in the first place. Your brother's main work is farming? Yes. Um, does that involve, it appears here, to involve a good deal of moving about? Yes, it does. Um, you know, he would, for instance, um, start off early in the morning, sort of, um, and in the previous evening, he would have looked around what field, what, what farm needs attention, which needs plowing, which needs weeding, and so forth, and he would have talked to his men, you know, servants and others uh, in the evening. And early morning, he will go around and send them off to the field doing their proper jobs. Uh, then sort of later on, you know, around noon or just before, uh, he'll carry some food and water to them, which is where they have been working. Uh, this is their sort of break, if you like. Is that part of their wages, the food? No, this is quite separate from uh, the, the, the wages they will get at the end of the day. In money? Uh, no, in grains. <laughs> We've talked about class and caste a lot, yet from observation, these workmen are certainly not servile to the people who employ them. I they shouldn't think so. Um, they, 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 for all practical purposes, they have been absorbed into the, to my larger family. This is your mother? Yes. Uh, she has moved out of the household stage, I gather. Yes, she has. Um, she has... Uh, if you like, entered into the third main stage, which is which you could call the stage of withdrawal. So she sort of gradually moves more and more into the background, devoting more and more of her time to religious and spiritual matters. How many hours a day does she spend doing that? Um, to me, it seems very many hours, um, far too many, but um, I don't suppose she thinks she's putting in enough. The fourth stage isn't for everybody. It means renouncing name, possessions, and caste. The Mahatma marked the break in his life by disappearing somewhere or other for 14 years. He was met again by chance and persuaded back to the village on the understanding that he isn't the man he was. Shivesh, there's no evidence from your behavior, but I gather he's your uncle. Uh, yes, he is my uncle, or um, shall we say, being more faithful to the Hindu tradition, he was my uncle. To get the impression of very good relations between very young people and older people, maybe three stage one and the people in stage three, uh, is it a fact that this stage system does make for easy relations between the old and the young? Absolutely. I think... Um, the close relations between the children on the one hand and, say, uh, people in the third stage should normally be their grandparents uh, is, is utterly close. I don't know what one of them would, one group of them would do without the other. At the end of the Saraswati festival, the images of the goddess from all the village schools were put in bullock carts and paraded round the village before being flung into the village pond. The idea is that the goddess was, as it were, 
commissioned for a particular job to occupy that thing of clay, when she has done her job, the concluding ceremony makes that quite clear. Your job is accomplished. Now we'll take the life back out of this image and you be the goddess that you were, uh, go wherever you are, wherever your natural home is, which she probably does. And then whatever is left over is just the ordinary clay. So it's in a, a corpse, if you like. A corpse? It becomes a corpse. That may be a corpse, and this may be a funeral procession, but nobody can say it's gloomy. Is it a religious thing we're watching, or is it a great carnival? Well, you are doing uh, both at the same time. Someone from your sort of tradition would, would tend to think, well, it can't be religious. But then why should religion be something so utterly grim? Fun and religion don't seem to exclude each other, and that's the way you see it here. Maybe I'm being over tidy, but I've been trying to work out if there's one single thing on which all devout Hindus might unite. They don't seem to share a creed. The beliefs of a devout intellectual would scarcely be recognized by a devout peasant. Maybe that what unites them is to be found in ritual or action or the daily routine. Now certainly, all the devout Hindus I visited had a household shrine, they uh, had a ritual bathe, they went to the temples. But then you come across the sannyas figure, the man who breaks the ties. There the pattern does break down. He has no shrine, he visits no temple, he is beyond the gods. I asked the Mahatma if he could tell me why it was necessary to withdraw from social life. And his answer was that he had to in order to get nearer to God. And perhaps that is where all devout Hindus converge, in their will to come closer to God by whatever means best suits them. Worship and devotion for the ordinary man, knowledge and the mind for those with the gift for it, no way excluded, no way preferred, so long as the destination gets nearer all the time. <laughs> 